Like many of you, I grew up in a conservative Presbyterian church, and I don't recall ever hearing anything at that church about service with or to others. There was so much emphasis that was put on being saved and on saving others and on behavior that wouldn't get us a ticket directly to hell that there really wasn't any time for conversation about service. It wasn't until I went to college at an evangelical Christian college that I first learned about or heard about service as a way of being Christian in the world. Each year, the college I went to sponsored a huge service opportunity in Mexico over spring break called Potter's Clay. We would drive down in caravans, set up tents in the desert, and daily engage in service projects like building houses, helping to dig wells, teaching vacation Bible school, and a whole host of other activities like that. There was also an emphasis on service locally in Santa Barbara, which is where the college was located. As part of my service, I volunteered at a shelter for runaway youth. When I did the college's urban program in San Francisco, we were each required to serve at a soup kitchen. It's the first time I had ever done anything like that, and I found it incredibly disturbing. As you might imagine, my ideas of service were formed around doing things to help people who were less fortunate. Always, I felt good about being a helper and being in service in these ways. In fact, I probably felt way too good about what I was doing as a helper of people. After college and then in seminary and beyond, the ideas about service that I had been taught were beginning to be called into question. Who was I to think that I had something special to offer less fortunate people who were in need? And why would I think that one shift at a soup kitchen would make any difference in the long run? More than 10 years ago, the book Toxic Charity was written And that book rocked the church world in terms of how churches had been thinking of service. The book's claim is that when churches provide charity in the form of service or money to groups they think they are helping, there are times when they are actually doing more harm. The author then gives suggestions for ministry models that can work and that don't do additional harm. So as you can tell, the word service has been through the ringer. And most of us have this older idea of service in our minds when we hear the word. In our seven-step inner spiritual meditation process, the word service, may we be in service to all, is used entirely differently. We began this seven-week journey earlier this summer with no ideas about each step or what they meant. Some of us still don't know what they mean. In the first four steps, we're encouraged to contemplate on becoming healthy and happy, living gratefully, transforming ourselves, and on being loving and compassionate. And then in steps five and six, we focus in meditation on being mindful and we focus on wisdom and what wisdom is. When we get to step seven, we don't just leave it all behind and then go along on our merry way. Instead, we take all of our contemplation, all of our meditation into the world with us, and ideally, we're then living as different human beings in the world. Dr. Ed Bastian makes the connection for us between our meditation and being in service to all. He writes this, our task 
as we leave the meditation space is to gradually transfer this energy of love outward so that all beings can benefit from our experience of intimacy with the most profound aspects of our being, and we would say, and of our creator. As we do so, we can feel our consciousness spreading outward, bringing peace and a healing energy into the consciousness of all beings everywhere. Without pretense, we humbly send these qualities into the hearts and minds of those around us, and then throughout our neighborhoods, towns, regions, states, countries, hemispheres, and the whole world, the solar system, and the entire universe. We visualize and we feel the light, love, wisdom, and peace experienced in our own meditation being infused into all beings everywhere. Ed's description of taking the energy and calm from our own meditation out into the world is beautiful. So why isn't it as easy as he makes it sound? Although he does write about the difficulty too. I don't know about you, but if and when I meditate, it is often another experience in my day of needing to do something that should take a generous amount of time and doing it in much less time. I'm not sure I often get to the part of experiencing intimacy in my meditation or that I regularly experience peace or healing. Don't get me wrong, I could be feeling and experiencing those things, but how often do I give myself the time and space for this? That's the first issue. The second issue is that often there is this rough transition from meditation to whatever comes next in the daily schedule. To use a familiar phrase, we tend to hit the ground running and so any calm or healing energy that has come our way gets left on the yoga mat or the couch or wherever it was we were doing our meditation. None of it goes with us as we barrel into the next agenda item. A third issue is that even if we could get the first two in order and smoothly transition with our calm energy intact, all it takes is one obnoxious person or frustrating experience to send us back to ground zero of not calm or healed or loving in any way. So how can we be in service to all when there are so many ways it can go wrong for us? When I was in high school, after my disastrous season as a cross-country runner, which I talked about in another one of these steps, I played volleyball. It turns out, volleyball was my sport all along. I advanced quickly and became a varsity player. Our coach for the varsity team was Mr. Sanger. I knew him because he taught psychology at our high school, and I had taken it. I liked and respected him very much, and it helped that I did well in psychology. He worked hard with us, and he pushed us to do our best while offering encouragement along the way. He told our varsity team that he wanted to teach us how to do visualization. We would meet him at different times, sometimes before or after practice, sometimes during the school day on our lunch hour or another time, and he would lead us through visualization exercises. Sometimes he did this while hypnotizing us. Now before you get any ideas and think he was a creepy guy, he wasn't. He was a psychologist and he ended up in his lifetime doing a lot with visualization and hypnosis, especially with people who had terminal illnesses. I trusted him implicitly, and he was trustworthy. What he taught us as young athletes was that if we could visualize ourselves doing a skill or a play correctly, we would have a better chance of doing it that way. 
Before our home games, he would have us meet in the gym after school, and we would visualize the plays we would be doing in the evening's games. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was giving us alternatives to fear, self-doubt, self-judgment, self-defeating talk. He was also preparing us for meditation in the future without ever saying that. So what would happen if we were to be disciplined about developing a practice of meditation? Meditation, as we've experienced in the past few weeks, can be many different things and even have many different focuses. Regardless of which meditation we end up using, what if in the last 10 or 15 minutes of our meditation, we did visualization of our day? We could think about each item on our list of things for the day. We could bring each person we knew we would be talking to or meeting with to mind. We could imagine the strangers around us if we're going to be out and about. We could imagine the bus or Uber driver or parking lot attendant. As we bring each to mind, we would visualize how we want our interactions with them to go. If we knew we were going to have a hard conversation with someone or a group of people, we would visualize our presence and our words. After going through the whole day and visualizing how we want to be in it, which is as transformed people, living into our highest ideals, then we would bring the meditation to a close and from that place we would go out into our lives for the day. In that scenario, where we've actually visualized how we want to bring peace and healing and compassion to the world, I can imagine it happening. What we're seeing in the world of Christianity and those who identify as Christians today is a widening gulf between what is said and what is lived. Part of what step seven is really about is the idea of an embodied faith, no matter what the tradition. In our living out of step seven, we, in this congregation, are talking about an embodied Christianity. There seem to be very different ideas in the world of what that ends up looking like. For many, it means being authoritarian. It means a patriarchy that upholds a straight white male superiority. It means a capitalism that favors those with the most money and then gives them control over everyone else. It also includes claims to be enforcing biblical rules while constantly changing them for their own benefit. So how do we embody a faith that has been hijacked from the very beginning? One of the ways we can do it is by discerning, which means sorting and sifting through what is essential and non-essential. What were the essential teachings of Jesus? Love God. Love yourself love your neighbor, treat other people the way you want to be treated, don't do to other people what you don't want them to do to you, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, help the poor, visit the prisoners, protect the widows and orphans, care for the sick, always include the marginalized, love your enemies, be peacemakers. In some ways, it seems fairly simple to embody a faith centered on Jesus, and in other ways, it seems impossible. And that's why a meditation practice seems invaluable if we want to live in service to all, meaning lives in which we bring peace and healing to all beings we encounter. 
This becomes impossible if we are unable to ever find a place of peace and healing in ourselves with God's help. One of the ways this seems to be manifesting in our current climate and culture is through burnout. Interestingly, we're seeing it across the board in terms of professions. Faith leaders are burning out at higher rates. Teachers are burning out at higher rates. Activists and organizers are burning out so quickly. Healthcare personnel, police officers, therapists, social workers, even students, as we see how enrollment in colleges and universities is declining. Much has been said about the pandemic and how it's contributed to this burnout, and I think a much broader perspective is needed. While the pandemic has obviously contributed, so has the rise in authoritarianism around the world, the lack of trust and transparency in religious institutions of all kinds, the inability of school districts to offer education equitably and for all kinds of learners, an increase in poverty while the rich get richer, massive debt, the rise in violence, a rise in hate crimes and mass shootings. I could go on and list so many more things. And we haven't even touched on systemic racism, which centers whiteness and depends upon the oppression of every other racial group constructed. On our best days, this is all way more than we can handle. And on our worst days, well, we've seen the results. So in the midst of this reality, how can we bring peace and healing into the world if that's what service to all means? Believe it or not, it can happen through meditation. There are two key aspects I want to highlight. The first is about the intentions we bring into meditation. In the chapter on step seven, Ed Bastian highlights the law of causality, which states that everything that happens has an impact on the future. He then says, if our intentions in meditation are only for us, or only for the short term, say for the next hour, we're missing an opportunity to influence larger scale change. If instead our intentions include short-term and long-term, self and others, then our actions have greater chance of impacting the world. He claims that the more profound our intentions, the more profound are the results of our meditation. Instead of only seeking our own health and happiness, if we seek health and happiness for all beings, which is big, if we can seek for all beings, then we expand the scope of our intentions and the results. It doesn't mean that every meditation we do has to focus on the entire universe, including the solar system, because that would be difficult. As we begin to dedicate our meditation, whatever our meditation has been, it's in that moment of dedication that we think about going out into the world, that we can broaden the scope which then impacts our desire and intention to be in service to all. The second key aspect goes back to what I learned in volleyball. If we cannot see it in our mind's eyes, we probably won't be able to do it. How we use visualization in meditation is so important can we visualize ourselves at peace? What does that look like? Can we visualize our communities at peace? What does that look like? What would it look like for a Chicago at peace? 
Can we visualize healing in ourselves, in others, in our city? What does healing look like? How do you see healing? Can we visualize leading with wisdom and others leading with wisdom? This is where community comes in. Sometimes I can't see something that some of you are able to see. Sometimes you can't see something that I am able to see. We need each other and we need the most diverse ways of seeing, and we mean that metaphorically, seeing metaphorically, so that together we can visualize the peace and healing we want to bring to all beings. In our text in Galatians 5 that Jerry read earlier, we hear Paul helping the church in Galatia with visualization. You were called to freedom, church, Paul declares. Freedom, he tells them, looks like serving others with love. The law, he tells them, can be seen in one picture. Love your neighbor as yourself. In today's meditation practice, we're going to do some visualization. May our intentions in meditation and our dedication to living from all that transpires in our meditations be big enough for what is needed and big enough for the God who is more than enough. Amen.